Well, folks, here we go. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Mind, Body and Soul podcast with John Morris. Today, we are in Victoria, Australia, as I get to meet with the awesome Australian author, mother and cancer survivor, Kate Gale. This is a lady who has literally been to hell and back with cancer, but rather than me telling you her story, here she is to tell it in her own words. I was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 27. I never wanted to shy away from a challenge. I suited up, I strapped on my superhero cape, and I faced cancer head on. I lost a breast, I endured chemo and radiation therapy, and I lost my identity along the way. Climbing the mountain, which is cancer, was no easy feat. In fact, it was the hardest thing I have ever had to do. That was until I heard the words, you have cancer for a second time. Only this time around, it wasn't me. It was my husband. Five years after my diagnosis, Bob was diagnosed with renal cancer. And here we were facing yet another mountain. I want to share with you all how I beat cancer how I found my identity again, and how I found the courage to dream big. Hi, I'm Kate Gale, a wife, a mum, a fun-loving character, who just happens to be a cancer survivor. This is Thanks for the Memories. Welcome to the Mind, Body and Soul podcast with John Morris. Inspiring, motivating, and educating you in finding balance in the craziness of day-to-day life. Learn from and listen to a man who has a wealth of life experience, from business to bodybuilding, artist to author, and has learned to deal with his own physical and mental wellness. But that's not all. Each week, John interviews and picks the minds of special guests from all around the world and from all walks of life, from actors to authors, wrestlers to warriors, business owners to life coaches, and so much more. Welcome to today's episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, welcome to the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast, where we help you find balance in the craziness of day-to-day life, providing inspirational, motivational, educational content. I am your host, as always, John Morris, and today I'm really, really excited because we're talking about survival more than anything else, and particularly with cancer. My guest today is an author. She is the author of the much-acclaimed two books now. Um, the first one is The Breast is Yet to Come, and the second one, the brand new one that's going to be coming out, is called Thanks for the Memories. She is a, a mother, and, and so many other amazing, amazing attributes go along with this lady, and I am proud to welcome the one and the only Australian author, Kate Gale. Kate, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm very well. Now, that was an incredible intro. Thank you. <laughs> I was interviewing yesterday uh, a professional wrestler, and and one of the the funny things about that was uh, you know doing that intro and trying to remember everything that that's there, um, you know, and, and he just sort of smiled and was like, "You got it," <laughs> you know, it was wonderful. <laughs> Made me sound very good. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that, that is always the aim is that we get our uh, guests over with our audience and, and present them because a lot of people around the world, you know, have never met these uh, guests that we have on. With that in mind, Kate, what I wanted to ask you is for those that haven't met you, share with us a little bit about yourself and what it is that you do. Okay. So I am just your everyday wife, mum, and you know, chick that just gets out there and and loves life. So um, I had three dreams in my life and those dreams were to get married or be a hairdresser, get married and have children. I know not exactly reach for the star dreams, but they were my dreams. So um, I became a hairdresser and I was in the hairdressing industry for 20 years and loved every minute of it. Um, I married um, my dream man, his name's Bob, and I had two children. Um, and all this happened by the age of 26. Wow. So life was just cruising along nice and, and you know, joyfully and, and easy, I should say. And then at the age of 27, after a self-breast examination, I found a lump 
and I was diagnosed with a rare aggressive form stage three breast cancer. So as you can imagine, my life was turned yeah. upside down in a split second. Yeah, definitely. Um, and my joyful, easy life um, all of a sudden became an absolute whirlwind. Um, and we got on the roller coaster of cancer. So when I was going through my first, um, well, my cancer journey, I wrote my book, um, never intending for it to be published. Um, it was just my diary and excuse the pun, but it was the way, my way of getting things off my chest. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was my therapy. It was, yeah, I, I just felt um, I was in survival mode. Yeah. I had two daughters that were three and one at that wow. stage. So I just had to keep going. There was no stopping. There was no way that I was giving up. Um, and I had a brick wall. I I couldn't show people that I was vulnerable or that I was weak yeah. um, because I needed them to give me strength and to hold me up and to get me through it. So writing became like I said, my therapy, but it became a love that I just had to flow with. I just had to go with it. And like I said, never intended for it to be published, but um, I published and and started making a difference in the in the breast cancer world. Absolutely. And I mean, that that there is so much to unpack um, with, with everything that you just said. And obviously, we're, we're going to get into it today. Um, you know, it, it's an incredible journey and I think for anybody that's going on this journey and their cancer journey this is going to really really benefit you. Kate I wanted to ask you uh, you know going back right at the beginning what was life like for you as a youngster and as a teenager? I, I grew up um, in a regional area. Um, I'm the youngest of three girls and I suppose being the youngest of three girls, I had to fight for my, my spot. <laughs> and I suppose you could say I was the rebel of the family because, you know, I was just destined to stand out. Yeah. Um, two very loving parents and still to this day, very loving, very supportive, still very much together. Um, we were just talking about that the other day that um, how many people get divorced these days and yeah. how lucky we are to still have mm -hmm. parents that are, you know, solid and and together but you know grew up in a regional area so farming was a thing for us okay um yeah so a very very loving family and um very close-knit family i should yeah. say that's fantastic um and, and we always ask that again to build up a, a, a bigger picture you know obviously as, as what as, as um mm. of the the characters and the, the guests that we're interviewing in, in doing preparation for this um, interview with you, uh, there's been so many different things that are going on. Obviously now uh, the statistics that are out are saying, particularly in the UK, one in two people at some point in their life is gonna end up with cancer. Um, you know, there's all sorts of misconceptions that are out there that I, I and again, I'm not a doctor in any way. All I can go by is my own research and, uh, and these things. But one of the misconceptions that I kind of want to touch on with you is, you know, the misconception that cancer almost like leaves trails. It has telltale signs. And some people are believing now that, you know, for, for the majority of people that have cancer, you can spot it, you know, way before it ever happens. I don't know that I personally agree with that. And the reason being is because some people, yeah, I mean, it may be written into DNA and things and, and all that kind of stuff without doing the research deeper. Obviously, I can't answer to that. But I think sometimes the, the first telltale signs that some people have, you know, is things like severe, more, more than normal tiredness, like you found with yourself. Uh, you know, there may be a lump for, for guys, it may be in the genitals, it may be in the armpit, it, it can be anywhere. Um, you know, and yeah, what was kind of your experience in the first telltale signs that, hey, I've got something isn't right? Nothing. <laughs> and I know that sounds really weird. Um, it's interesting. I was cutting a, a yeah, I was cutting a, a clotea and she had been diagnosed with breast cancer just the week earlier. Wow. And she had actually wow. been getting really stuck into me about self-examination and do I do it? And I'm like, yeah, of course I do. Of course I do. Everybody does it. Yeah. 
I never had. <laughs> I was keeping the conversation going. I was keeping her quiet, yeah. to, you know, so to speak. <laughs> and the next morning I had a shower and I thought of that lady and I did the self-examination at Amber Lump. Wow. And as soon as I touched the lump, I knew something wasn't right, but it was just a gut instinct that something wasn't right. Um, because of my age, I got bobbed off a fair bit yep. in the beginning. It took them six weeks to actually really think, mm, hang on, this isn't right. Um, but I still to this day always say go and get something checked yep. because I never felt sick. I never, I wasn't tired. I was a mum that was busy who was yep. working who found a lump mm -hmm. and and the telltale signs of you know they say that a, a breast cancer lump doesn't hurt it shouldn't hurt mine hurt right so it was things that you know it shouldn't have been yeah. especially at my age and the type of cancer i had but i had it uh -huh. so yeah there was no early telltale signs and, signs uh, it was a lump yeah, and, and I'm glad you, you touched on that because, again, I think people, and, and, and the advice that you gave is, you know, if you are concerned, go and get it checked out. Even if it's, you know, even Absolutely. if it's a small thing, um, you know, some people, and it, again, it seems to be uh, more guys that are prone to cysts. Um, you know, one of my best friends, he's got a cyst on the top of his head um, that he never got checked or he never, you know, got dealt with. Um, and I think a lot of the times people can be quite scared about going to you know the doctor in case the doctor says you know you have you know cancer um yeah. as someone that's battled with health issues with colitis and and lord knows how many other things you know i i understand that but again you've got to have those regular checks because i think like anything if you catch it early and early enough your survival rate is really increased as opposed to if you you know if you, if you leave it and you aren't checking regularly um, so again, you know, and I know we, we, we jumped, you know, humongously there because obviously in between, you know, your uh, early life and your teens, you know, to, to, to getting cancer, you've obviously got married to your, your best friend, your, your wonderful life partner, um, and then obviously had kids as well. Things are going incredible. You find a lump um, and obviously you go and get it checked out. What's going through your mind when you're sitting in the, the doctor's surgery or the, the hospital, wherever it was? And they say to you, you have stage three aggressive cancer and it's in your breast. Um, my thought was, I'm going to die. Yeah. Um, because all I knew of cancer was my uncle passed away when he was 33 of a melanoma. Um, and I was five at that time. So I, I do remember him. Um, and all I remember him is being sick and there was a big thing that my dad said, if it gets to your lymph nodes, because that's where it went for him, okay. got to his lymph nodes, and that was what undid him. That's That was the nail in the coffin, yeah. so to speak. Um, so when I'm sitting there and they said, you know, it's stage three, um, it spread to your lymph nodes, yeah. it's, you know, this, 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 it was just panic stations. But panic stations as in I just went deathly quiet. Huh. And the world just span. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. You know, I could hear people yeah. talking, but it wasn't. It wasn't it, comprehending. It, it, it was, what it was, was like happening. a state of shock almost. And I went through a very similar thing because I, I suffer with dyspraxia, and I and I always laugh about this with my wife um, because she's like, in events that you'd expect someone to be really, really terrified in, I tend not to be. And she's like, how do you do that? And I said, there's a very simple reason for this. My brain just doesn't work that quickly. <laughs> so when the world is going around and all these things are happening, I'm sitting there like, oh yeah, oh look at that, you know. <laughs> but then when it registers, it's like, oof. Um, but when they told me that I had a UC ulcerative colitis um, and that there was no cure for this, well, I didn't know what it was. I was 15 years old and I'm sitting there in the hospital surgery saying, okay, well, you know, this like anything else is going to go away. But obviously, you know, some things are uh, obviously a lot longer. Um, but when it finally registered with me years later, when the doctor said, you know, it could become cancerous or your bowel could explode here. Um, you know, if it isn't untreated, then I, I did the exact same thing. It was like the entire world still went on as normal. Um, but, you know, just in my head, everything slowed down. Time slowed down to a halt. 
Um, was your husband with you at that time when you were having the um, news delivered in the in the doctor's surgery? Yeah, no, no, he was. He was a hundred percent there with me from the moment that um, you know my GP called and said, "Look, it looks malignant, Kate. Uh-huh. This is what's happening. This is where you need to be." Yeah, um, yeah, hundred percent beside me every step of the way. What was the the drive home like after that? Was it you know conversational or was it just silent? Um, it was a bit of both going on. <laughs> um, it was, like you said, I was in shock. Yeah. I, yeah, I just didn't know. Um, all you want to hear is you can do this, this is going to happen, and yeah. then you're going to be okay. Yeah. And I think that was my thing of, nope, this is going to be a really long road uh-huh. and I'm in for the fight of my life. Yeah. Um, so there was a lot of crying from me, mm-hmm. um, a lot of sobbing, and I was angry. I actually went from silence to anger. Um, And you're redhead as well. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Bob's really good at calming me down in those situations. (laughs) Thankfully. (laughs) I totally understand because the the funny thing with Katie and I, you would expect her with the red hair gene to be the more, um, you know, not to 100 really really quickly but it tends to be more me that uh because i I carry the red hair gene as well and uh yeah i I think there's definitely something in it um obviously you know you're starting to go through the whole process of you know and, and again it is a normal process of the shock and then into the anger um you know and it i think eventually probably the acceptance okay i've got this now you know i I, I've got to fight this. I've, I've got to keep on going. What was your mindset, you know, when you finally had accepted, I've got cancer and this is what we need to do? I, having the redhead gene, <laughs> I am a very strong-headed person and a very stubborn person. Um, my Anger was what drove me okay. in the beginning. And that kept me going. And if I heard from one more person to say to me, <laughs> just one day at a time, just take one day at a time. And I'm just like, yeah, you're not the one on this hamster wheel. Yeah. I am. Yeah. And it felt like I couldn't get off. Um, but my girls, just the, the thought of my girls of not having a mum, yeah. that that just made me even stronger to, you know, the, the mindset changed from, you poor thing, yeah. what's going on? Um, I'm in shock to, no, you're not getting me. Like, I'm stronger than you yeah. Um, yeah. and you're not going to get me. So, like I said earlier, it was survival mode yeah. and it was blinkers on mm-hmm. and I was just trying to get to that end. I think that's a really good point that you make and, and anger can be a, a tremendous uh, motivator. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and, and we've always said, you know, when anger is channeled, I don't think there's any greater human emotion um, apart from love. And obviously the love that you had of your, your daughters and your family where you're saying, you know, you, you had found your reason why to keep on going. A lot of other people, you know, when they hear news of I've got cancer, it, it's, it is like a death sentence. You, you see them change, you see their mindset just completely change. Whereas for you, you know, it was completely the opposite where you're saying, you know what, this isn't it. This isn't the end here. Um, and I totally get that, totally, you know, respect that. Obviously you would have to go through a lot of stuff as well as we'll talk about, um, you know, to, uh, to, to get to where you are. But you know, you, you had your reason why. Um, I wanted to ask you as well, you know, how did your daughters take it um, when you told them? Uh, or, or was there a comprehension that mummy's sick or was it, you know, how, 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 how did they respond? Yeah. Um, like I said, they were three and one. And yeah. my three-year-old at that stage, her name's Brianna and my youngest is Gemma. And Brianna's always been a very switched on little girl like a very smart little girl and Jemmy was just she was a baby yeah um but we did Bob and I actually spoke about how far we were going to go with what we tell the girls um 
of course, during treatment and things like that, mummy was going to change. Mum yeah. was going to lose her hair and things like that. So um, we kept it very simple and we never lied to them. Yeah. Never once. Mm -hmm. So it was like mummy has cancer um, and it's going to make her sick. Yeah. And this is what mummy has to do to get better. A special medicine is going to make her hair fall out and whatnot. So, and I say to this day, I am so grateful that I know it was awful that I was so young and that they were so young, but I'm so grateful that they were little. Yeah. And that they didn't understand yeah. <laughs> how big it could have yeah, been. Abs absolutely. Um, you know, and, and like I say, I mean, cancer, I think, you know, affects all of us in one form or another. We all know somebody who has uh, cancer. My wife's dad uh, passed away when he was eight, or when, when she was 18 years old, um, and she struggled with that for a long time. My auntie ended up with leukemia, you know, that the hair loss um, really affected her because she was a very proud Irish lady. Um, and um, again, similar, had a fiery temper as well. It must be something in the, in the water. Um, but, you know, and, and for me seeing that, um, you know, it, it was interesting because she passed away not long, not long after I was 18. And um, it was interesting seeing the changes in her, but in my mind, I suppose, because I was older, you know, I, it was, you know, how can I help? How can I keep things, you know, going along for her? In your book, uh, your new book, which I thoroughly, thoroughly loved, haven't finished yet. I'm thoroughly loving going through it, though. Thanks for the memories. Um, you talk about the chemo procedure. For those who have never had chemo, don't understand the procedure, walk us through um, the average day in a life of someone who is going through it and what the procedure is like. Yep. So it is, I have to state, it is different for everybody. Yep. Everybody has a different chemo journey, so to speak. Um, mine was... You, know, you have to have blood tests constantly. Um, of course, they're checking your levels, um, your white and your red blood cells, and they play a massive, massive part. And the easiest way to explain chemo is they are killing every cell in your body, good and bad, to try and kill the cancers that are within your body. So essentially they kill you to bring you back. Um, so my, my journey was... Um, I would go and see my oncologist that morning. Um, a few days prior, I would have had blood tests done. So I get the, the green light or the, uh, uh, you're not having it today, depending on, the, on your, your levels, your cell levels. Um, so I'd go into the chemo room. Um, I had a port inserted in my arm. Okay. So chemo actually collapses your veins. So to for them to attempt to put a needle in every single time, yeah. um, it can get, one, very painful, and um, two, pretty much non-existent yeah. in a couple, after a couple of chemos. So um, a lot of people either have an arm port or one in their chest. Wow. So I had that arm port put in, and then they'd hook me up to a, an IV line. So you would have um, fluids, just saline pumped through. Um, then the chemo would go up. Um, still to this day, I remember looking up at that first chemo and, and we used to call it the red devil because it was really, really red. And my nurse was brilliant. She talked me through the entire bit and what was going to happen and, and how I might feel. And, yeah. and so, but um, yeah, the, the red devil came, started coming down and I watched it hit my veins and I had in my head that I'm going to feel instantly sick. I'm going to be nauseated. I'm, <laughs> this isn't going to go well. And it was the complete opposite. Uh -huh. Like they have just come so far with anti-nausea drugs and yeah. um, trying to make things easier for you. But um, it was essentially sitting in a chair all day. I used to be there all day and I'd have my chemo. Then you'd have more saline and then you'd go home. Um, I used to have it every three weeks. And I was pretty much out for the count for the yeah. first week. And then the second uh, and the third week, I would be pretty much normal. Okay. <laughs> and you'd line up again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I found it really interesting. Uh, a friend of mine who was older when he had it basically likened it um, to, I think he actually said, you know, it, it's fine as long as you don't mind feeling like they've injected you with napalm. Um, and he had a really bad experience through, through his. And, and that's, I, I use that reference to, to give somebody who's never had cancer, never had cancer treatment, um, I suppose a, a kind of a, a, a marker to, to understand really what it can feel like and, and everything else that was there. Talk to us a little bit about some of the um, after effects, obviously, of having chemo. You, you mentioned hair loss. Talk to us about, talk, talk to us about what, what you went through. Right. So my uh, extreme fatigue, <laughs> um, like I said, I, I'd, I'd be on the couch. Yep. My mum used to come up yep. um, and I'd be on the couch, looked like I was asleep, but I wasn't asleep. I could hear everything that was going on, but I just didn't even have the energy to open my eyes. Okay. Um, and that pretty much lasted for an entire week. Right. Um, right. On and off, you'd feel a little bit nauseated, but nothing to the point of you know, if I was ever going to be sick, I never got to that point. Okay. Um, but there was days of, you know, you felt pretty blurt. Um Pins and needles in my feet and in my hands. Um, that would last for a good couple of weeks. Wow. Um, and being wow. one, a mum picking up your children, um, two, a hairdresser trying to, <laughs> um, you know, pick up scissors and stuff because I worked. The You're whole still working through. at this time. I was working. Wow. <laughs> I think wow. back now, completely insane, but um, I just needed to do it. Yeah. I, that was my normality. Yeah. Um, yeah, just to keep going, but um, loss of taste. Okay. I couldn't okay. taste anything. So anything that was strong tasting um, Doritos, I don't know if you guys have yeah, Doritos yeah. in there, like corn yeah. the seasoning. I would lick the seasoning off those corn chips just so I could taste something. Wow. You know, just something wow. other than, yeah, everything was like cardboard, wet cardboard. Wow. Yeah. And weight gain. <laughs> yes, yeah, I have heard. Weight that. gain was a yeah. mm -hmm, was a big one, but all the anti nausea drugs and, and things they're all steroids. So, okay. you know, I know my oncologist said to me at one stage, "Don't worry about that. You deal with that yeah. afterwards." Yeah. Right I, I now, was you need Do you struggle with motivation? Feel yourself procrastinating a lot? Have amazing ideas and dreams, but struggle with the concept of how to get from where you are to where you want to be. Or maybe looking for something a little bit simpler, like wanting to get fit, or maybe wanting to lose a few pounds and tighten things up. Are you someone that struggles with anxiety or trauma or even depression? You're not alone. Many people around the world do. Hi folks, I'm John Morris. And for the last two decades, I've been working with people from all over the world in all walks of life to really understand human beings, the concept, the behaviors, and ultimately the reasons why. And I've had the privilege of coaching and working with folks just like you that maybe are struggling with anxiety or depression or trauma or wanting to get ahead, wanting to maybe build some long-term success but have no idea how to begin. This is what I do. And with John Morris Life Coaching, you're in really, really good hands. Why can I say this? Because you're not only going to get an experienced life coach, you're also going to get somebody that has a wide variety of experiences from youth ministry and working with teenagers and children to someone who's worked with drug addicts and alcoholics, people that have day-to-day -day dependency issues, to, to somebody maybe just like you that just wants that little bit of encouragement, wants that little bit of motivation and wants support to get to that next level. With John Morris Personal Life Coaching, you're in really good hands. A lot of my clients would tell you if they were here now that one of the greatest assets to John Morris Life Coaching is you can see things exactly as you want to see them without fear of being controlled and conformed like a lot of therapists and coaches do. We help you right where you're at to get to the place that you want to be, step by step, to figure out a plan. So if this sounds like something that you would be interested in, having that support, motivation, encouragement, and even education, should you need it, then get in touch with me today. I would love to hear from you. Places are limited, so please don't delay. We've got a very, very small window of opportunity remaining. We all need help from time to time, but the difference between success and failure, achieving our dreams, and maybe just letting our dreams go by, 
depends on the level of help that we have available and that we're willing to accept. So get in touch with me today at John Morris Life Coaching. You'll be glad you did. I was going to ask you because um, one of the treatments for colitis is uh, steroids, it's IV drugs, um, which I am, I've, they found that I'm highly allergic to them. What kind of, oh. if any, oh yeah, that, that was, that was um, an extremely interesting period of time, <laughs> to oh, say the least. Gosh. Um, and and I, I say to, to folks, you know, and, and my wife and I, I'm sure we'll, we'll do an interview at some point and a show together about it, but um, it was literally like, uh, two separate people. That's the best way I can describe it because you were pumped so full of these drugs. And when the effects took hold of me, because I'm more, apparently I'm, I'm one in, I don't know how many hundred thousand that takes these reactions. Um, it was literally like being somebody else. And this took years to get out of my system fully. Um, and it's one of, like I said, one of the rare things. I was going to ask, you know, w were there any side effects from you aside from the weight gain, you know, in your head? Or was it just you know, that there was maybe one or two things. Yeah, it was, it was just a, a you know, a few things. It was um, probably the one that is still with me and it's still a, a big thing that I have to work on is the anxiety of it all, yes. of what's next. Yeah, no, yeah. of course. And, and like, obviously, I think we were talking the other day, um, you know, anxiety obviously comes from fear and, you know, I suffer with it. You've obviously um, been very open and, and, you know, discussions that you, you suffer with as well. We're not the only ones. Obviously, there are millions of people around the world that we're helping uh, that literally suffer with anxiety. Um, oftentimes, anxiety comes from the what if or what has been. And that's the thing that people try to fear or, or people do fear, I think, the most. Um, and it's easy for me to sit here, you know, and say, well, if you focus on the present, you're right here, right now, you know, your anxieties can, you know, dissipate. The realities obviously are that, hey, yes, I can focus on the, the present, but I know subconsciously, you know, that there is still stuff to come, you know, that there is medication, there is treatment, that there's all these things to, to, to cope with. Um, and like you say, you know, the anxiety of, okay, I've been injected, I'm being injected again. And so, you know, how long am I going to have chemo for before, you know, is it going to work? Is it not going to work? You know, it, it's, an, it's, it's an incredible battle to, to go through. And the stress, obviously, um, you know, it's, it's understandable why you want to keep life as normal for yourself as possible. How was your emotional state during this whole process? I thought I was fine. <laughs> I <laughs> the way that you said I was, that. <laughs> uh, uh, well, hindsight's a wonderful thing when you can look back. Yeah. Um, like I said, I journaled the entire time, so that was my way of dealing with things. I was offered copious amounts of time counseling yeah. along the way and i'm just like fine yeah seriously i'm fine i really am um but it wasn't until i got to the end of my active treatment which was about 18 months after my diagnosis wow. when my oncologist said to me okay i don't want to see you for six months mm -hmm. and i went oh hang on a minute my life has revolved around yeah. hospitals, doctors, nurses, needles, everything. And all of a sudden you're telling me, okay, you're fine. Off you go and get back to your normal life. That was my yeah. moment of going, wow, I'm not okay. Yeah. And oh my God, what just happened? Yeah. So I think I was in survival mode and it was one foot in front of the other every single day just to get through that day. And then someone took my safety net out from underneath me and I went, well, yeah. And, 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 it's, <laughs> and that's where things started to unravel. I was going to say that because that's often what happens, you know, is, is you can have, you know, again, that, that period where you know, okay, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, I'm going to the hospital, you know, Friday, Saturday, I'm working and, and, and that's your routine. Um, when that's all of a sudden changed, that can really cause uh, a massive I, I suppose almost like a bulldozer to, uh, imbalance wise to our psyche and every transition that we go through, you know, you almost have to go through it in stages and slowly to be able to mentally cope with it. Um, you write in your book and, and I really, really wanted to pick up on this because I, I was white hot 
and furious. I was laid in, my, uh, in bed next to my wife and I said, you'll never guess what someone said to Kate or someone said about Kate. To, to say that I was annoyed was, was a, you know, because I couldn't believe somebody would say that. To, to set the stage, folks, in Kate's new book, uh, Thanks for the Memories, which will be available very, very soon, I believe, uh, Kate. Do you have pre -sale a pre-sale starts in November? <laughs> there you go. Pre-sale start in November, folks. And we'll talk about obviously how you can purchase Kate's book, um, you know, at the end of the show. But she writes that I don't know if it was a neighbor or a person had said a couple of different things, but one of them that really stood out to me was the one that this person had said to your husband, have you seen what she is doing? And, you know, have you have you seen what she is doing to you? Basically insinuating, well, she's got cancer. Have you seen what she is putting you through? And I can't remember if it was something that you wrote or if it was something that was in my head or both. But I think the next phrase that came up was, yeah, like I decided I want to get cancer. You know, I queued up and I waited for this. And I just could not believe that somebody, well, maybe I can actually, but, but somebody would actually <laughs> see these things. Knowing humans the way that I do, um, it isn't that far a stretch away from my mind, actually. Um, what was kind of the you know support level that you had from families, friends, and obviously talk about some of these things that um, you encountered along your journey with other people. <laughs> that's no, that's a really good question because we were just talking about this the other day that people, when they get diagnosed with cancer, the hardest thing is to tell people that you have cancer. Yeah. Um, telling my mum and my dad was probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Um, <laughs> but funnily enough, like, this is so ridiculous. I used to be a smoker back in okay. the day and I hadn't smoked for years and years and years. And the day I got diagnosed on the way home, I said to Bob, you need to stop at the, the milk bar. And he said, <laughs> why? And I went, I want a pack of smokes. And he said, what? And I went, don't look at me. Don't give me that look. This is what I want to do. I'm, um, so I bought a pack of smokes. I went home and I smoked that entire packet, but I was calling who I had to call, like the close family and friends who I wanted to know and what was happening at that stage. And I sucked down those, those cigarettes like they were lollies. And my mum was actually there and she said, what are you doing? I went, it's all right, mum, I'm going to have chemo and it's going to kill anything else that I'm putting in there. So I just knew, like, as soon as I said it, I thought, you are not right. Like, yeah. you're not in the right headspace. We called Bob's best mate. Um, he hung up the phone. And after Bob said, Kate's got breast cancer, and he hung up the phone and we have not spoken to him since. Wow. He hasn't reached out, anything. And I get it. Um, he doesn't know what to say or, ha yeah. or how to deal with it. But at that point in time, Bob needed his yeah. friend yeah. and and he didn't have him. Um, one of my bridesmaids, I called her and she did the same thing. She, I could hear her cry and then she hung up. And then <laughs> wow. she came back about an hour later and she said, oh, I'm so sorry, I just didn't know what to say. Yeah. So, yes, you lose friends along the way. Um, yes, people don't know what to say yeah. to you and, and or how to say it. People don't know how to broach the subject. Uh -huh. So that person that actually said that to Bob was a very close family member. Wow. So that's someone that's still in our lives okay. and something that I still haven't let go, but yeah. I choose to forget. Uh -huh. um, but they have since been through a cancer journey. Right and have seen the other side of it. So I know <laughs> if I went to that person and said, hey, remember saying this, they'd be mortified yeah. because, yeah, like she, she had a, um, a mindset of, oh, well, if you've got cancer, God gives that to you. Right. And God gives to yeah, you right. what, yeah. what yeah. one you deserve and what you can handle. Yeah. Um, but I know the mindset. Of, of this person has yeah. definitely changed in yeah. that direction. But and, and I think that's that is one of my big things mm -hmm. in life is people need to talk about cancer. Well, well, that's it. Yes. And that's part of the reason that we're, we're doing this show. Um, 
to give people again, I know you and I have talked about this, but to give people from all walks of life and because everybody's got a story, folks, to give people from all walks of life an opportunity to share, you know, some of the really difficult things in their life in a, I guess you'd say in a, in a safe environment where only, you know, a couple of million people are going to see us. Um, you know, but the, the whole thing about this is exactly what you said there, that people don't know how to broach the subject of the unseen illness. The, and again, mental illness mm -hmm. is, is another um, thing that people just don't know how to talk about. If, it, if, it's, if you can't see it, then how do we talk about it? How do we actually broach the subject? And I've, I've told people before, I, you know, I said, don't go up and basically laugh in the person's face, but you can treat it with a sense of humor. You know, when Absolutely. I was diagnosed with colitis and I, and I told people, you know, this medication may make me shit through the eye of a needle, basically. And that was a direct quote, um, you know, and the person who was in tears because they were like, oh, well, at least this, at least that. And they were thinking, you know, John's going to be put in a box before too much longer. Um, and they were listing every single symptom. The other thing that I want to say to you folks is if you are diagnosed with something, for goodness sake, do not look it up on Google. Of all uh, the Do not Dr. Symptoms. Google. <laughs> and all the possible <laughs> symptoms and things. Because that's what this person did and was sitting there. Oh, you know, he's, he's going to have this and he's going to have that. He's going to have the other. And, and when I said that to them, they just sort of lifted the head up, turned to me and just smirked. And it was okay to talk about, you know, at that point. And that's what we want to do is to have, you know, people... I suppose in as much way as possible, get comfortable with, you know, it's okay to talk about cancer. You know, yes, the person- 100%. Afraid, but, but what I was going to say was the person like yourself may be afraid of what they're going to go through, but hey, I'm sure they'd rather go through it with, you know, their friend and with, you know, their family as opposed to, well, I'm going to hang up the phone. You know, you, yeah. you spoke there about the, uh, the impact that it had on Bob as well and, um, how was that on him? You know, obviously his wife's got cancer, you know, his, his, his best friend's hung up and, and he may pick up the phone again at some point. But, you know, how was that from on him on, on an emotional point from, from your point of view? Bob is a very close book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's the person that I can read. Yeah. Um, but he doesn't let those little things eat away at him. Okay. Okay. Unlike some other people. <laughs> I understand, yeah. So, when we come into this world, we come in with a sense of awe and wonder, believing that things will work out for the best, filled with excitement. We play like children and we enjoy our lives. But as we get older, we found out that everything maybe isn't as rosy as we first thought it would be. Live life long enough and you realize that what once seemed like happy families can very quick turn into Dungeons and Dragons. Have you ever experienced anxiety, worry, or maybe even fear on an insane level? I want to let you know right here, right now, that you're not alone. Everything from homelessness, betrayal by my best friend, abandonment from the people that I thought would have my back. In fact, I've experienced so many different situations. To tell you all would take a very, very long time indeed. But the good news is I'm here to tell you that, well, they've left their mark on me. I've come through all of them. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. And I've got a brand new book. It's called The Battles That We All Face. This book is designed to give you encouragement. It's designed to give you hope. It's designed to teach you, to challenge you, to get you to think a little bit more. The full title is The Battles We All Face, a devotional with a difference. Because I don't want you to just read it from start to finish. I want you to take time over this. I want you to read the first chapter and really process it. This book is designed, if nothing more, as I said, to challenge you, to encourage you, to give you hope, but ultimately to let you know that whatever you're facing, you, my friend, are not alone. I want to encourage you right now to not let fear or the past stop you from living an amazing, amazing life. Each page in this book has one of my art pieces in and has been specifically placed there to give you the reader an association to the subject discussed please don't delay 
You owe it to yourself to start rebuilding your life. Life is not over until you draw your last. Don't delay, order today. Life is short. You owe it to yourself, as long as you're drawing breath, to stand up and fight for the things that you want in life. And my friend, you've got an ally in me who understands completely what you're going through. Have an awesome day. Click that link below, and I'll see you on the other side. In the future, if he's if his best mate, like we're talking, we're nearly 13 years down the track. Right. Um, right. You know, if he reaches out to him and, and says, you know, hey, how are you going? I know Bob will be fine with it. Yeah. He'll he'll talk to him. Um, but yeah, he he holds things very close to his chest, and he and he's not a big emotion sharer. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, we uh, you know, kind of the same that we're the emotional ones and our partners tend to be more the, <laughs> the level-headed ones. You know, nothing bothers them too much. Yes. So you, <laughs> you, you, you've gone through the chemo. Um, you've had a lot of emotional things to deal with. What was really the next step in, in your journey? The next step was trying to find the new normal. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when that oncologist said to me, go out and enjoy your life and, and get back to normality, um, I really had to do a bit of soul searching and, yeah. and realise that I, I was never going to have that normal back yeah. because that Kate that got diagnosed that day and heard the words, I'm sorry, you have breast cancer, is not the same Kate that is standing yeah. at the end of active treatment. Yeah. So, again, um, I buried my head in the sand a little bit and I just tried to be normal, mm -hmm. like go back to work, um, raise my children, just be a mum, be a wife. Um, but I had a real burn in my stomach mm -hmm. that I needed to share yeah. my story. Yeah, yeah. I was 27 and at that stage it was unheard of that a 27-year-old had the type of cancer I had and I felt like I needed to share that to help others because I didn't want another 27 year old to have to go through what I did yeah and we're going to touch about that but before we do that um you know it, it's funny that you used a very very specific phrase that I, I definitely want to touch on folks once we go through something severely traumatic in our lives we're never the same and in my brand new book the battles we all face which is available at the battles we all face .com, I talk about that, you know, and it's a chapter in there specific that says once broken, never the same. And it talks about the minds. It talks about relationships. Sometimes we can go through things that are really, really traumatic. And, you know, out the other side, we, we can have a relationship with someone that's maybe even better than it was before. It may be even worse than what it was before, but it will never be exactly the same as what it was before. Um, I've been through things in my own life and I know that has changed me uh, dramatically and drastically over the years for better and for worse. And like Kate was sharing there, you know, she's gone through a cancer journey and there was more still to come. Um, but, you know, for her, she wasn't the same person as, you know, what she would eventually end up being. And I think that's one of the, the greatest lessons that I can teach anybody is you know, when you go through these things, expect to change. You're not going to be the same on the other side as you were when it first happened. And that's okay. That is completely fine to, to have that. Kate, I want to ask you as well, um, when did you decide, because you, you'd gone through a lot before you, you got to the point of, hey, I now want to write a book. Talk to us about that process a little bit. Okay, so... Like I said earlier, I it was my journal, it was my diary, my therapy. It was never intended to be published. Um, I went to a hair show. Um, that in itself was a massive step for me, my trying to get back to my normal. Yeah. I had about four inches of hair on my head okay. and walking into a hair show with these amazing, beautiful hairdressers that had faces full of makeup and their hair beautifully coiffed and whatnot, and here was me, I, you know, 26 kilos heavier, four inches of hair on my head, feeling very ugly, out of my depth. But I knew I needed to walk through those doors yeah. to try and get back to my normal. Yeah. 
I, with the hairdressing side of things, I didn't know that I wanted to continue in the industry. Okay. Um, one, I had changed. And two, I just didn't love it like I did yeah. beforehand. But this woman came out onto the stage who was the presenter and things that she said to everybody in the audience about the chemicals that we use, um, that we breathe, all those sorts of things, yeah. just be careful and be aware of what you're using. Mm -hmm. I know myself as a hairdresser before cancer, I never gave it a second thought. Yeah. Yeah. But it was when I was going through cancer and you're trying to work out in your mumble jumbled head, why did this happen to me? Um, that that moment I just went, wow, that was powerful what she just yeah. said. Anyway, I scurried out at the end and I thought on the way home, I need to email this woman because I just need to say thank you so much for what you said because it, it got me. It made me really sit back and think and hopefully it, it got into somebody else, not just me. Um, and we just got emailing back and forth and she just happened to be a publisher. Wow. <laughs> so she asked wow. to read, yeah, she asked to read my diary and I just went, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she kept harping and, and she, it went from my diary to being called my manuscript. And she just chipped away every mm -hmm. now and again. And I just went, you know what, just read it, you know, because you made a difference to me maybe you reading something and this might make a difference yeah. to you. So she read my manuscript and fast forward a few months and I was in her area, um, which is the top end of Australia. And she called me and she said, oh, I see on Facebook that you're in Queensland. And I said, yeah. She said, you need to come and spend a couple of days with me. And so I did again. I can't leave my kids for two more days, but hey, Eight, you know, take the bulls by the horns and let's just do this. Step outside your comfort zone. So I did. I went and stayed with her and she took me to this big warehouse and I met a man, um, funnily enough, by the name of John Cash. <laughs> and when I walked in the door, he hugged me like my dad wow. he hugged me. It was a weird hug, but I needed it. Yeah. It was just, I, I will never forget that hug. And he said, Michelle has given me your manuscript to read. And I nearly killed her. I like, I turned around and just looked at her as if to say, how dare you? That was for you. And who is this man? And he's cuddling me and he's read my manuscript. Um, okay. Like I was, <laughs> I was in a very vulnerable position yeah. right there. And then, and he said, this needs to be published. So he and his company actually paid for the publishing and, you know, the printing wow. of my book. And that same day, he um, he gave me a trip around the world, working along with hairdressers and doing photo shoots in amazing places. And yeah, so it was actually on that trip that I completely let my guard down and I went, I need to share my story. Yeah. I need to publish this and I need to make a difference because one, Michelle has made a difference in my life. Yeah. But this man who doesn't know me from a bar of soap, he's read my manuscript yeah. and he's given me an amazing gift and I can do that for somebody else. Yeah. I, somebody can read my words and go, wow, that's me. That's how I felt. Huh, I'm not alone and I can do this. It, it's incredible that you know again there's so much to unpack that's there um you know and, and one of my personal beliefs and, and i think a couple of doctors had said this as well with all the, the chemicals and the exhaust fumes and everything that's out there that is one of the contributing factors to why cancer is on such a rise and i think people would have to be blind to to you know to, to not see that um you know that the second thing that comes out of, of of what you've just said there is the fact that amazing things can happen you know, from the most unexpected things. And oftentimes our life experience is the greatest thing that we can use to help others, that we can teach others through, and, and we can see so many lives changed. And obviously for you, you know, it went on to an extraordinary journey um, of writing your first book uh, and, and just, you know, how that has helped to change so many people's life. 
walk us through a little bit of the the process of of writing the book because I know you talk about this uh, in your in in your new book. Thanks for the memories, uh, which will be available very very soon, folks. Um, but walk us through that process of you know I'm, I'm I believe was was it this one where you were leaving home for a while and then you know you you were going basically you just needed to get away and it was like I I need to just go and and do this. Walk, walk us through that. Okay, so the first one was a journal that I wrote that as I was going through it, as I was living it. Um, my new one, um, my husband was diagnosed five years after me. Wow. With renal cancer. Um, that was the turning point in my life of what the hell have we done? Why us again? But it didn't take me that long to work it out this time around. <laughs> um, so, yeah, writing this one was hard. It was really hard because I didn't write it as I was going through it. Okay. I was recounting things and I was trying to get across what I've learned along the way mm -hmm. and how I'd lost my identity and I didn't realise that I'd lost that original Kate yeah until I heard those words, you have cancer again. Um, and that the world didn't revolve around me and that the world didn't revolve around breast cancer because there are so many other cancers out there. Yeah. So writing this one again has been therapy and cathartic, but this one's been really hard, really hard to try and put it together so that it flows yeah. and makes sense of where I'm trying to go with it. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. That makes complete sense. Um, talk to us a little bit about, um, I suppose, yeah, that the moment that you, you know, felt that you'd lost your identity and if, if there was that moment when you kind of started to feel like yourself again. My aha moment <laughs> <laughs> was eight years later okay. um, after my diagnosis when I finally realised that I am worthy mm -hmm. of having a breast reconstruction. Okay. I had gone eight years with one breast. Right. Um, before cancer, I was a tall, slim, long, red-haired, flowing woman who was proud of myself. And then I lost a breast, which I have to say, it didn't worry me that I lost a breast. I needed it gone to... Okay. to for me to still be here yeah. so questions like did you feel like half a woman no <laughs> never um did you feel someone actually feminine? asked you that oh yeah yeah <laughs> um <laughs> do you feel less feminine no no i didn't Whoa. um i still had another boob but <laughs> i just had i Sorry. had a prosthetic <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, you've got oh, no idea. The, the questions that come towards me are insane. But like you touched on before, I use humour. Yeah. I have every single boob joke out there. <laughs> um, I, had, <laughs> I had little parties for every step of the way. So I had a separation party when my boobs got separated, when I had the mastectomy. Well, I had a... I had a um, a thank God it's over party. And then I had a reunion okay. eight years later <laughs> when my boobs were going to get put back together. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was that moment when I decided, yes, you are worthy to spend yeah. money on yourself. Yeah. And yes, you can be a whole woman again. Um, that was my moment of putting me back together yeah. and... I can be normal again. Normal yeah. is it's such a broad word. Um, <laughs> you can be you again. But I felt whole. I yeah. felt whole again. Yeah. I just, I, yeah, I felt like me. Yeah. And, and I think it's really interesting, a couple of points that you touched on there. Um, and there's two, and, and, and I'm still just, just laughing in my <laughs> head that somebody asked you some of these questions. Um, oh, yeah. But because I know from talking with other um, guests on the show that had had cancer and, and very similar journeys to, to yourself, um, 
you know, one of them in particular found, and I know, you know, it, I know some people are going to find this strange to hear a guy talking about this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, you know, when she went to put on a bra for the first time, and all of a sudden it was like I, I, and that was for her her moment where she was like um it, she actually just burst into tears but then it was the because she was still going through all the stress and everything that was there and this is something folks that you know it, it's the small things in some ways that trip us up people think oh it's going to be the cancer or the chemo that really really upsets people and and that is upsetting don't get me wrong but it, it's sometimes the small things you know that really trip people up when all of a sudden they, they remember more than anything um you know some of the things that have gone on um the other thing that you picked up on kate which i want to touch on with you is this the whole thing about self-image because uh, i as, as you can see behind me uh, at one point was a very very proud uh, mpa british bodybuilder thoroughly loved it loved how i looked um and then i was diagnosed with colitis um and you know they pump you full of steroids and they pump you full of this and that and the other to, to get it under control and your body image does change you know and and uh, unfortunately i told my mix midsection this year and you know it, it's been a, a re you know a, a re uh, alignment process basically to a rehealing process to, to get back to to normal um but one of the things that I found when I looked in the, the mirror was, and you're looking and you're feeling bloated and there's this whole thing about self-image. And then you see all these people on social media and on the news and on this, that, and the other, that, you know, have abs on top of abs and muscles on top of muscles. And you're looking at them and you're thinking, well, a lot of that, first of all, is Photoshop, but people are buying into this. How was your image of yourself at this point when you're going through chemo, your body's changing and you're having to readapt and saying, well, I'm not looking like that anymore, but I'm proud now of, of what I've accomplished and how I appear to myself, if, if, if no one else. I actually just found a photo of myself going through chemo and I actually, I just wrote a blog on it because it took my breath away. Yeah. I, like I said, I touched on, on weight gain and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize how big I had actually got. Right. Um, right. And then I saw this photo the other day. However, I'm proud of that person that was in that photo mm -hmm. because I know what she was going through yeah. and what she had to get through. And you touched on it then. It's the small things. It was, I couldn't wear a low cut shirt. Yeah. Because, you know, I had a prosthetic breast what if people saw that I had a plastic boob in there yeah. um no hair um being a hairdresser yeah, yeah. having your hair cut by a bald hairdresser that's weird um so I didn't really when I was going through it it wasn't body image wasn't really in the forefront of my mind it was that point when everything got taken like my safety net yeah. got taken away that again the anchor you know crept in that bloody hell like what else can you throw at me uh -huh. you've yeah. taken this you've taken that you've thrown that at me and now I've got to deal with this 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 yeah. like it was yeah it was a lot yeah um yeah and I think that's where the the anxiety and the stress and everything was starting to pile yeah definitely and you know and, and again I think a lot of people need to realize because I, I I have gone through this and I'm probably still going through this now as a a person with colitis that's in somewhat of remission but when you reach your 30s you're no longer in your 20s obviously you're no longer in your teens your body changes naturally anyway um and obviously you know when you're going through chemo and everything else that's been pumped out, it's going to change even more than than what you you know first expected it to uh first yeah. expected to and, and what a, a normal person would go through um Walk us through the, the stress and the anxieties of what you're facing. Obviously, we were talking about um, your, your self-image. You were talking about all the, the things that are going on. How did you deal with the stress and anxiety that was there? At the time, I didn't. Okay. I didn't realise that I was stressed and anxious. Oh, yes, yeah. Again, one foot in front of the other. Yeah. And I really put myself out there in the sense of, one, publishing a book. Yeah. Um, but I, I did a lot of public speaking and oh my gosh, the anxiety of going to an event, yeah. the lead up to the event, actually to step out there and do it. And I knew as soon as I got out there, I'm going to nail this yeah. because this is me. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And this is my story and I can't stuff this up. Yeah. Um, But the lead up to that was crazy. Um, I did get to a point where I just went, you know what, I need to step away. I can't keep doing, I was exhausted because I just, I needed to help so many people and put myself out there and make such a difference and raise as much money as I could and and all that sort of stuff. But it just came to a big, I need to stop Mm -hmm. and I need to get back here. Um, And that's when Bob was diagnosed. What was your yeah. emotion, obviously, when Bob gets diagnosed? Because how old would the kids have been at that point? Um, eight and five. Yeah, so they're getting a little bit yeah. older. Their understanding is a little bit more. Was it the same process with the kids as before? You know, daddy's got cancer. There's going to be some things that are going on or no? No, no, it was completely different. Um, he actually, they saw him very sick. He... Um, we thought he had kidney stones and um, long story short, when you have kidney stones, it's like you're going into labor. Yeah. Like you have contraction pain. Um, so when we got to the hospital and, and of course I knew all the emergency doctors and the nurses from when I was hanging around um, and, and they, you know, pumped him full of drugs, painkillers and whatnot, yeah. sent him off for a, and a scan to try and find these kidney stones and they came back and it was a couple of hours actually between him having the scan and, and us sitting there and we were laughing our heads off. We were in this cubicle with, um, you know, the sheets, yeah. <laughs> the curtains, that, you know, people think you can't hear things, but you can. <laughs> um, and we were sitting there laughing, going, what are we doing here? Seriously. Yeah. Um, the doctor looked at me as he walked towards me and I knew instantly the look that he gave me was I'm about to break some awful news. And all I remember is my head going between my knees and I just screamed. Right. And I was screaming, no, no, not again. And my strong husband was sitting there explaining to the poor intern why my reaction was so yeah. big. Um Again, we didn't want to lie to the kids. We needed to keep them in the loop. Yeah. Um, they know that cancer's bad, but we didn't want to alarm them either. Uh-huh. Um, and Brianna, our eldest, she was starting to show signs of anxiety around that time. So we we had to tread very carefully, but again, tell them what they needed to know and didn't give them detail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What kind of cancer was it that um, Rob had? if I can ask. He had a renal cancer, so kidney cancer. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. And I'm assuming much the same treatment as yourself. Um, how, you know, how was the uh, after effects? Um, and obviously he's pulled through it, which is wonderful. Completely different to my right. cancer. Okay. Um, I learned a lot during his, his journey because he had a seven centimeter tumor in his kidney. And in the breast cancer world, that's massive. That's yeah, yeah, not definitely. good. So I went into panic stations. Um, but it seemed like when I got diagnosed, it was like full steam ahead. When he got diagnosed, no, we waited two weeks till we saw a urologist. And right. I'm turning inside out going, hang on a minute. Yeah. You know, he's got cancer in him. And why are we pussyfooting around? Yeah. Why are we not going hard at this? Um, he had his complete kidney removed it had encapsulated itself in a fat capsule that was calcified um and he didn't have to have chemo and he didn't have to have radiation therapy wow he just yeah (laughs) so (laughs) again add to kate's anxiety kate's stress taking on everybody else's stress I also threw in anger that yeah. we were on this roller coaster again, and then add a bit of jealousy in there as well. Of course, um, and, <laughs> and, 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 and it's understandable because you know, like, well, well, I've just gone through all of this, and you just get it cut out, and that's more or less it. Um, the, yeah. I was just thinking when you were talking there, um, when we were talking about humour and we were laughing about things. 
my dad had to go in for, uh, I believe it was a, uh, an endoscopy because there was a, a suspected uh, tumor that was there and the doctor couldn't measure it because apparently it was so big in the colon, but he did say when my dad was, you know, semi-conscious, well, it's not the biggest I've ever seen, but it's a fairly decent size. And when they got out, I mean, it was, you know, it, it was huge. So, you know, that's, that put me a reminder of that. Um, goes to show folks again, you know, you know, everybody's, uh, I think, uh, you know, someone that knows someone with cancer, obviously, or, or with uh, certainly tumors and things. 100% and everybody's different. Well, absolutely. And, that, and that's, that's, I think, one of the things we do want to emphasize that everybody's journey is different. Everybody's cancer story is different. Everybody's uh, treatment in a lot of ways is different. Um, yeah. What was it like for you, uh, going back, I suppose, to, to your story, when you received the, the all clear and, you know, this has worked, you know, and the, the cancer isn't there at this point? Um, relief. Of course. <laughs> But I also had a moment of, <laughs> it was a real clarity, I'm okay. Yeah. And I will be okay. And even if I didn't make it, yeah. my girls are okay yeah. and they will be okay. Um, yeah, it wasn't, you will never get, we call it here Ned, no evidence of disease. Okay. So we don't use the word remission um yeah, it's it's no evidence of disease, and and I must admit those six monthly, twelve monthly checkups that you know you yeah. go to that <laughs> bloody awful. Um, but I got stronger yeah. as I went. You now I got to a point where um, my oncologist tired, so I had to find a new oncologist, <laughs> um, and I'd go to Melbourne to okay. see this oncologist. So it was an hour and twenty minute drive to the hospital down there, but I used that time to get my head right, to get my head in the space and to put my big girl pants on and, and go, you know what, I can do this. Yep. How have you changed emotionally from when you, uh, I suppose, was diagnosed and even before diagnosed to where you're at now? I'm so much more chilled out. <laughs> <laughs> you sound it. It's, it's just like, ah, oh, it's fine. But I think when yeah, people I am. go through those I, things, yeah. they are, yeah. <laughs> we joke about the fact that I am a stubborn redhead and a firecracker and I am I stop and I smell the roses now I don't let the small things worry me yeah. I don't sweat on it um my biggest thing I suppose is I can now recognize when I'm not okay okay whereas before it was just push on until yeah. the point of no return um, but now I can recognize that, you know, I've, I've had a big week. I've had a huge day. I need to deal with this step back. Yeah. Take some time for me. Yeah. And, 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 and it's okay to take time for me. I, I, well, well, that's it. And, you know, again, another life lesson is, you, you know, again, if you can't, you know, look after yourself, then you're going to struggle looking after somebody else. And I know we, we talked the other day um, after obviously a really stressful day for you. And, and you know, it, it's wonderful to see uh, the growth in you. We're able to recognize that and say, you know, uh, I need to look at and examine everything that's going on in my life and look at basically what I can cut out. Because when you're being dragged in 800 different directions, it's not good for you. It's not good necessarily for people that you know, that, that you're working with or the, the you know, the task that you're trying to, to put together. So that's, that's a really, really awesome thing and a really awesome step. Kate, is there anything that you want to touch on that we haven't touched on at this point? Big questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think we've, the biggest thing, and, and we touched on it before, was being worthy. Yeah. Um, that everybody is different and everybody has their own journey and to be able to speak about cancer like break down the barriers you can't catch it yeah you can cuddle someone you can go up to them and and you can say to them i have no idea what to say to you yeah but just know that i'm here yeah simple things like that people just need to start opening up and and talking it's about it and the person as well huge huge i don't i still get anxious 
doing even this, you know, all day. So do I, and I'm posting it. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, very easy. You know, I still get anxious doing this. Mine. <laughs> yeah. But putting myself out there again and, yeah. and going to release this book, like I am nervous as all hell that it's going out there again. However, I know that it needs to be done. Yeah. I know that I'm going to make a difference. Yeah. And I don't do things to get a pat on the back. Uh-huh. I do it because I know that one person is going to read even yeah. one sentence and it's going to make a world of difference to them. Even That's if, why I do it. Even if, um, you know, somebody that isn't going through cancer books, let me tell you, you know, it is a great eye opener for, uh, uh, to give you an understanding of what people are going through, what's happening and everything else that's there. And I think that's like you said, Kate, you know, that's, it's, it's all about having those conversations. And I still get really anxious and really nervous and, and uncomfortable about telling people, look, as a result of my work environment, I ended up with post-traumatic stress disorder, which then birthed BPD, um, yet to be diagnosed. But it's a really scary thing for me because again, like you were saying with cancer, people are like, oh, he's, he's, he's got that and he's, he's got this. And, and then people see you doing this and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, well how does that mirror up? Um, like, like you see, you know, like it's contagious or some, you know, weird free, freaky deaky do, you know, kind of disease and things. And, uh, without knowing the stories behind what people are going through, they can't really understand, you know, how you process the things the way that you do and, uh, and how you've ended up the way that you have. And like you said, I think it's, it's all about having those conversations. It's my parents hate me saying this, <laughs> but I, I am truly, truly thankful for having cancer. Uh-huh. And in a way, I wish that I never had it. Yeah. But I wouldn't be the person I am and I wouldn't be looking at life the way that I do now yeah. if it wasn't for cancer. And to be given, it's a strange way to put it, but to be given the honour yeah. to be there with Bob when he got diagnosed and to see that other side of cancer, yeah. that care aside, that what he went through, that I was now going through, I will be forever grateful for that. I, I completely agree. And I think it's, it is our experiences, folks, that really make us. It's our experiences as well that often shape our destiny and our journey. Because, you know, I, I've spoke about this before, obviously, with, with our audience, that had I not ended up with colitis, I would have never left bodybuilding. I would have never, you know, built uh, my first business, which was the art business, Art from the Heart. Um, I'd never be doing this now um, had I not wrote my uh, my first book earlier on this year. So things oftentimes can really, really come out of, you know, bad situations. You know, the peaks often come from the valleys. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an incredible journey that you've been on. And uh, I'm so excited. Kate, for the audience that's at home uh, and that's interested in getting in touch with you or checking out your books, where can they find you? Okay, so my website, um, www.kategaleauthor.com. Um, everything's on there. There's blogs on there. So you can read a little bit more about my journey along the way as well. Um, yeah, but Thanks for the Memories will be out mid or pre-sale mid-November and um, hit the shelves first week of December, so just before Christmas. That is so exciting. And I, I am literally, you know, so thankful again that, that you and I have connected and we're developing a friendship that's there. Um, very similar journeys through very different uh, life experiences. And it's been a blast. And Kate, I'm sure this won't be the only time that you'll be on because, you know, there's so much more, I think, of your story to tell. And I want to thank you so much for being on and being my guest today. Um, And I hope you've enjoyed it. (laughs) I have 100%. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, folks, that has been the Mind, Body and Soul podcast. Hopefully we've inspired you, educated you and motivated you to try and find balance in the craziness of your own life. Don't forget to hit that like, subscribe, I'll try that again, like, share and subscribe button. Tell a friend because it could make a big difference in their life. And don't forget to come and uh, go and check out Kate's book, but also to come and visit us at thebattlesweallface.com where you can check out my brand new book if you're dealing with anxiety, trauma, letting go, enjoying the moments, enjoying the memories, and so much more that's in that book. This is literally a book for everybody. It's a very, very easy and simple to read um, devotional style book with some of my own most beloved artwork that's in there that's been specifically chosen for this book. You'll absolutely love it. 
You can pre-order now at thebattlesreelface.com. And the book comes out, I believe, on October 30th. So that's really, really exciting. That's at the battle we face, we all face.com. I'm doing well here, aren't I? The battles we all face.com. And uh, until next time, I've been your host, John Morris. This has been the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast, and we are out of time. Take care.